Uh, thanks, Eric, and, and thanks for the invitation. So the object I'm interested in today is the thermal two-point function. Um, so it's defined like this. And can you hear me still? Uh, for convenience, I put one of the operators on the other side of the thermal circle. It makes some of the questions nicer. And I'm interested in the large M limit. So imagine we have S, Y, K, or N equals 4, and we take N. We want to understand what happens to this object. So we expect that at, at late. And this approach is 0. So that's the same as uh, uh, thermalization. But the question is, how specifically does it approach 0? What does the function look like? And what characterizes this approach? Uh, this approach to equilibrium. Uh, uh, so a nice way to think about this is to get a complex frequency plane. So you get transformed to omega. And let me give the in four super yang mil. So this is the operator. And let, uh, uh, let's look at its two-point function as a function of the Coupling. So at strong coupling, we have holography. The two point function looks like this. So this is in the complex frequency plane. It has isolated poles and they go off at an angle. So this isolated poles. Um, and what that means in, in the time domain is that we can write g of t as a sum of over exponentials. Oh, yeah. yeah, so in the in the retarded greens function, well, so, so this is in the uh, uh, this is in the Whiteman function. If if you were to analyze the retarded greens function, it would only be the lower half. Uh, uh, so these guys that Tom referred to are called the uh, the quasi normal modes, and these are the uh, their KMS images. So this is in the full uh, complex plane. So it, it, it has a meromorphic uh, continuation to the full plane. And uh, the poles go off at an angle. Uh, and this is sometimes called the Christmas tree. Um, well, this is called the Christmas tree. This would be an upside down Christmas tree and a right side up one. So this is an interesting stru uh, structure. It, it, it turns out that this is a, sig a signature of the black hole singularity. So I'll explain this later, but the idea is you have this new region of the complex frequency plane, which is omega goes to I infinity or omega goes to minus I infinity. So this is not usually there. This is not usually a good asymptotic limit. Uh, usually the asymptotic limit we take is large real frequency. We have this new region of the complex frequency plane and we can uh, study the correlator there. And that's related to the black hole simulator. But let's put this off for a second. And let's go to lambda equals zero. So this is free field theory. So this calculation was done by Hartnell and, and Kumar in 04. And what you find is cuts. And also, you, you definitely cannot take omega to I infinity. So that's Fine limit. So these look very different. And the question I want to ask in this talk is in between. Um, so, in, in other words, we have a very stringy black hole, which is still not free. And we want to ask how this stringy black hole behaves. It's convergent for all all times to be greater than zero. Absolutely, um, and I'll, I'll define the operator uh, in the second part of the talk. Yes. Here I'm doing R three, S three. 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think. Right. So. Yeah. So S3 above Hawking page is going to look like this. S3 at zero coupling, I don't know, but I, I expect probably there's no cups. Uh, no, this is n equals four. Yeah. Uh, say again. Uh, I'm sorry. There are cuts at one. Yeah. So, so the cuts go from uh, minus k to plus k, where k is is the spatial is that is the magnitude of the, of the spatial momentum on the RC. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, or, or or K in this case. Right, so the question is what happens in between? And you might say, oh, this case is special because it's integrable. And so maybe the, the cuts are gonna turn into poles at, at any finite coupling where the theory becomes chaotic. So that's one perspective. Another perspective is this theory is special because it's maximally chaotic. Um, and so maybe at, at any large but finite coupling, there are cuts that come down from infinity. And the answer is we just don't know. We don't know the, uh, the analytic structure of this uh, correlator at finite coupling. And uh, it's, it, it would probably be good to have some examples where we can actually compute this thing. So this is not one of them. Um, I don't know how to do the, the, uh, the computation at n equals four at finite coupling. Um, but in these lower dimensional examples that we now know uh, very well, uh, we'll be able to do it. So the plan of the talk, um, I wanna review some of this stuff um, so this is uh, based on both old work of uh, Pesuccia and Liu, and also uh, we revisited uh, uh, this topic uh, last year with uh, Christopher and, and Robin and, and Sasha. So I want to review some of this um, old, uh, old uh, uh, the properties of holographic correlators, and then I want to see how much can be extended uh, to finite coupling in the SYK model. Any questions at this point? Okay. So, um, we should do the computation in, in a black hole if we're above the Hawking page transition. And in particular, we want an ADS Schwarzschild black hole. Uh, I will assume nothing except for uh, spherical symmetry. So this could be a, a charged black hole. It could be a higher derivative black hole. Um, and I just want to uh, study the general properties of this correlator. So here's, here's the metric I assume. Um, I go to tortoise coordinates, which are defined like this. And then the wave equation, it takes this form. So this is just uh, uh, the Schrodinger equation for a, a particle in a potential V of Z. Uh, which I will not write down. So the important, I, all that's important is it's asymptotic. So we assume a, a horizon and we assume an asymptotically ADS boundary. So what this means in terms of the asymptotic is that at z equals zero at the boundary, we have the following behavior. Uh, so here nu is defined by delta uh, minus p over two. Uh, delta is the scaling dimension of the operator. I take it to be a scalar. Um, it, it doesn't matter. Um, so that's at z equals zero. And at the horizon, it turns out to exponentially decay. And the decay rates are quantized. So this is a very special structure. So th uh, this is at the at the horizon. 
And then to compute our, our function g, um, it's useful to uh, first compute the retarded Green's function. So this is the one with only, this is the causal one with only uh, poles in the lower half plane. And to compute this one, you wanna look at the boundary behavior of the, of the field, uh, which takes this form. So we have our usual normalizable mode and non-normalizable mode. And this is as z goes to zero. And then at the horizon, we impose ingoing boundary definition. And um, we want to find the solution that satisfies these uh, boundary conditions. And then the retarded Green's function of omega is the response over the source. Good. So what happens when the source vanishes? Because then we have a normalizable mode and it's also ingoing. So this is called a quasi-normal mode. You can't get normal modes in a black hole because there's no wall at the horizon. And the closest thing is a quasi-normal mode and they have uh, discrete uh, frequencies in the lower half plane. So from this expression, you see that the, uh, the quasi-normal mode frequencies are poles of the return green function. So this is not quite the thing that we want. Uh, uh, we want our, our two-sided correlator, g of omega, and this is defined by mgr over two cinch beta omega over two. So this is called the spectral density, and then you divide by this cinch. Okay. This is beta. Be very bad at this. Okay. So let me say some general properties of G of omega in any in any field theory. So first of all, it behaves nicely under conjugation. And also G of omega is greater than or equal to zero um, for real omega. So this, yeah, so I did have it, but this is, um, yeah, so this, uh, this is true generically in any uh, uh, field theory and um, you, you, you can derive it by um, inserting a, a complete uh, side space. Into it. So GR is in, in position space is the commutator function, and this is the Whiteman function, and you can, you can derive this relation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right, so two-sided is one-sided times e to the minus beta omega over two. Okay, good. So it, it, it has this property under conjugation. It, it, it's also even. Uh, so this is called the KMS condition. And it's why I, I chose uh, the two-sided correlator just to make this KMS condition very nice. And lastly, um, it has a nice limit, um, and the limit omega goes to plus infinity. So in this limit, g of omega approaches the two delta minus b. So in this limit, uh, uh, the identity operators is contributing in, in, in the light light channel, 
and, and you get this universal behavior, um, the power law times the next transition. So this should be true in any CFT, and it's at large positive frequencies. Do not apply this everywhere in the complex. Thing. So these should all, always be true. And then we have our more mysterious holographic properties. And these can be derived um, by so, uh, 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 solving the wave equation for our specific potential. I, I, I have this potential, which has these uh, general boundary conditions. And uh, there's a statement about scattering theory, which is that, so first of all, um, G of omega is meromorphic. So it can be extended to a meromorphic uh, function in, in the full complex frequency plane. That's one statement. And also it has zero. So this no zeros property is to uh, this exponential decay at the horizon and the, and the precise forms of the decay rate. And um, for potentials of that type, you can derive this uh, no zeros property of, of G of omega. And it's, it's kind of mysterious. Yes. Uh, sorry. Um, right. So the, uh, the two-sided and one-sided correlators are related by this factor. This e to the minus beta omega over two. Um, so yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, in particular, you if you Fourier transform this, you do not find a singularity. Or well, maybe it's four percent. Yeah. So well, I, I I haven't derived it, but it's um. So I can tell you how, how you derive it in words. So you take this wave equation, you rewrite it as an integral equation uh, called the uh, Volterra equation. So this is in scattering theory text. And then you uh, solve it iteratively. So you, you plug in the first exponential decay and the second and the third, and you see that you, you generate um, um, zeros that cancel these poles. And, and, and you generate no others. And so um, this turns out to have no, so it's a little bit of a computation. Right, so, so I think nothing is known. And I mean, if, if we really have a, a completely general CFP, uh, it should not be. It should certainly not be. Analytic. I mean, uh, for instance, if we don't have large n and we're on the sphere, it's a sum of the delta. So it has no analytic. Um, but we could hope that at large n um, and at, at infinite volume, um, there's at least a meromorphic uh, continuation in, in some in some region of the plane. But that's part of the question. Yeah. How much hold in general? What does chaos mean for analyticity? Open question. And it, it, it should not be universal. Okay, good. Yes. Or you can also do minus infinity and then just it Okay, so you we have these all these properties. Some of them are obvious, some of them are mysterious. Um but you, you can combine all these together, and what you learn is that G of omega is just a product over its poles. So in these very special holographic systems, uh, this is the full function. No, I, I, I will. Yeah, so it's it's it exponentially decays, and that uh, that's going to be the, uh, the signature uh, signature of the black hole in the red. 
Okay, so we have this, this formula, which we call the thermal product formula. Um, this is a product, and it's thermal. And yeah, and it's a formula. <laughs> so all the ingredients are there. So what I want to point out is that if you know all the poles, you know the pole function. So all, you don't need any residues. You just need the pole. So I, I haven't used this one yet. Um, is, is which just effect? It, it, right, so it, it's all these properties combined. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And part of the question is how, how, how much does this extend? Yeah, to find it. Yes. Yeah, so um, you should really write this as, I think it, uh, so this expression is, is, is it agrees with the previous one on the real axis, and, and it's an analytic continuation of, of this expression, yeah. Yes, yes, I, I hid that. Um, it, it, so it, it relies on the fact that it's an order one function in, in order for these uh, this product to uh, converge. Otherwise, you need these uh, wire stress factors. Order one uh, function, it follows from the WQG approximation of this of, of this wave equation. Yeah, it just means that it, it decays um, at most like either the minus constant times omega in all directions. Which is uh, true enough. In, in the in holography for these uh, uh, wave equations. Well, it's a little stronger because it has to uh, decay everywhere. Yeah. Okay, so now we have this formula and we haven't quite made complete use of this yet. So we can now start uh, bootstrapping, if you want to call it that, because we know that at large omega, this has to approach two delta minus d. And we can uh, try to constrain the asymptotics of these quasi normal modes um, uh, 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 using this condition. So, one, so, so let's try uh, them going off at some angle uh, uh, with power. So it, it could be at n to the one half at n squared. And when you plug this in and you and you try to match, so and then uh, plus lower orders in there. So when you uh, plug this in and you, and you try to match, you learn that they're equally spaced. So and R And you, you can keep playing this game. The constant term is going to be fixed in terms of delta. And you can keep going. And you get an infinite set of sum rules on these, on these uh, quasi-normal modes that come uh, from the OP, uh, the OP exam. Because leading orders here, the stress tensor contributes, uh, double stress tensor uh, contributes, um, et cetera. And each order has to match this product formula. So you can learn um, non-intuitive sum rules on these, on these quasi normal modes uh, that way. But I don't want to talk about that. Um, I want to erase. Because now I, I want to address Eric's question, which is how does it behave at omega equals I infinity. So we have our, our solution. And I should say that this is not the only solution. Uh, contingency uh, constraint. Uh, uh, you can have uh, multiple lines of, of quasi normal modes, and those uh, show up in, in general. Uh, but this is the simplest uh, solution. 
And it, it arises in the case of ADS black brains and black holes. And let me just write the formula um, in ADS D, ADS D plus one. So, So you, you can check that this satisfies this consistent uh, uh, constraint from the bootstrap. And in the complex plane, again, it has this. And and now I want to uh, go to omega equals i infinity. Uh, the the delta shows up in the constant term. Uh, this is an asymptotic expansion at large f. So there's a constant term which depends on delta. Yeah, yeah, and and there are also one over n uh, to the well, one fourth square condition. So um, I can now uh, take this uh, solution and plug it into that formula, and I can go to large imaginary omega. And what do I find? Well, I, I again find exponential decay. Uh, but it, it, uh, there's a different decay rate, uh, which I call beta tilde. And beta tilde is beta uh, times the cotangent of beta. So that's how it's related. So what does this exponential decay rate mean? Um, so let's explain it following uh, Fasuccia and Liu. So imagine. This one? You solve the bulk wave equation. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, the the simplest way is this multiple Nitzke approach, where you you expand the wave equation uh, near the singularity, and then uh, near the ADS boundary, and and you match along the stokes line. Yeah, I, I think it knows about everything, but uh, yeah, it, the way you compute it is, is new. Yeah, so. Um, the way to understand this is to define a very strange thing. So usually, uh, the, uh, the Green's function, sorry. Uh, uh, usually, the Green's function, the Green's function, is the integral over C, what I've called C here, uh, d omega to the minus i omega t, uh, g of omega. Let's in instead consider tilde. Uh, so now we enter which goes on the imaginary axis, and we of t to be the uh, the analogous uh, quantity. So how does this thing behave as a function of t? Well, if you um, if you look at this, you you, uh, you find that t has a singularity. At beta tilde over two, uh, plus or minus beta over two. So, what does this singularity mean? So, it, it it's actually proving the uh, the fact that the Penrose diagram of, of the black hole is curved. So, what I mean by that is that we draw this picture. Suppose you compute the uh, uh, the two-sided correlator in the geodesic. So this was done by Fitkowski, uh, uh, Benny, Jenker, uh, Klebin. Um, and what you see is that there's a, a way for a null geodesic to go into the, into the black hole and bounce off the singularity. 
and it's hit the at a time which is beta over two. Sorry. Uh, beta tilde over two. So that's what's causing this uh, singularity. Now you don't see this uh, singularity on the, on the first sheet of the correlator. You, uh, you have to analytically continue in, in the time domain, and that's what this weird contour is doing. So it's a very uh, a subtle answer that you get, uh, but it's a way to probe the black hole singularity in, in, in the thermal two-point function, which you might a priori have not expected to be able to do. I think the way to, to do it is, is like this. I, I don't think it's been worked out. I think they were not precise. Uh, but the, the idea is that there's multiple geodesics. And so there's, there's multiple geodesic contribute in the, in the geodesic approximation. So you, you have multiple analytic continuations, but they were not precise beyond that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, th I think it would be nice to work out the precise story in the two plane, but yeah, they, I don't think they did it in this paper. So another way of saying this is, um, oops, this paper. So another way of saying this is for a, uh, for a space like geodesic, we have a a turning point equation. So omega being the frequency, and I'll, I'll write it for ADS five. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the equation to get a, a turning point um, inside the horizon, ADS5. So there's two ways to get high energy. Omega goes to infinity. Um, and the first way is omega goes to plus infinity. So this is our, our usual high energy limit. And now the physical turning point RC of omega, oops, RC of omega, it goes to the boundary. Uh, so this is the usual turning point that we would expect at, at high energy. Uh, but now when you take this function and you analytically continue to positive imaginary uh, frequencies, omega goes to plus I infinity, you see that it's possible to get high, fre high frequencies at the singularity. And this is what um, this um, this new uh, correlator C tilde is 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 probing. Any questions about holography? That's 
above three dimensions. So I can say what happens in BZZ, which is, um, yeah, so the, there's no uh, curvature singularity and this is square. And uh, yeah, so in, in BTZ, um, all the all the quasi normal modes are imaginary for uh, for zero spatial momentum. And there's no new region of the, of the complex. Um, yeah, Right. Can I do charge? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I don't know the answer. Is I, I I don't know if we're rotating, but for charge, I tell you. Um, so for a charged black hole, you have these ordinary Christmas tree, and then you have these poles on the imaginary axis. So the way to understand these poles on uh, on the imaginary axis is you have, a, let's look at the potential V of R. So at R equals plus infinity, it goes to infinity. At R equals the outer horizon, it goes to zero. And then it dips below zero. At, at the inner, it again zero. And then it goes back up. And it, and it blows up at the singularity. Can sit. So we have a virtual bound state, and that's what this line of poles is, is, is probing. So, so again, you can see you can see behind the horizon physics um, just by looking at the quasi normal mode spectrum. Uh, and I guess you were probably asking if you go here or you go here, what happens? The answer is you get exponential decay with different rates, and you're probing some complex. Geodesics that hit the singularity, which, yeah, which I don't quite understand. I think they're, I think they're complex geodesics, and they end up being. I think if you if you if you go in this complex direction. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's too bad. Right, so I, I agree, and yeah. So another, all real geodesics would be here. You can't go here, but you can go here, and then you have a complex geodesic which is bouncing off the timeless singularity and, and going back, or maybe it's going forward, I'm not quite sure. Is everyone happy with holography? Yeah. All right, so let's move on. Yeah, so particularly. Yeah, so it, it's like the bulk point. So the singularity is expected to get worse and worse. Um, but then when you sum. So there, there's a story which is in the one sided correlator. You can have uh, uh, null geodesics that connect two of the boundary points. And in that case, the, uh, the geometry near the null geodesic is not, is not stringy, but 
there are strings to reference. And um, you, you can take into account the tidal forces and, 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 and try to resum them and, and see what happens to the singularity. In this two-sided case, you have both the string of geometry near the singularity and the tidal forces. And it, it's completely unclear how to, how to do the computation. Uh, perturbatively, you could, you could do it if you knew how to do string theory on black holes. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. You mean like order n or something? Or... Oh no, I have no idea. Okay, so um, we now have set the stage and now we wanna go to finite coupling. We wanna address the question I asked at the beginning which is what happens in between Lambda equals infinity and lambda equals zero. Uh, the problem is we have no examples. So, um, two examples. <laughs> okay. So, but it's it's the the point is it's hard to find examples of uh, uh, thermal correlators. And um, I will now describe uh, the only two I know. And they're they're more or less the same. So as, as you know, uh, we have this uh, very useful and amazing SYK model. And uh, it's uh, defined by an even number Q, uh, fermions. And they're interacting by this random interaction. And you're, suppo uh, you're supposed to average over this little j. And this is a random variable. Uh, and it's mean scales in a certain way with n, if I got it right. T minus one scale as n goes to infinity. Yeah, I should say, um, I only want to study infinite n. Um, so I, I take n goes to infinity, and then I take uh, q goes to infinity. So in, in this example, you can, you can uh, 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 study the two-point function analytically. And uh, so it's very simple. It's, it's a product of a gamma function. And this was done by uh, Tarnopolsky. So V is some uh, function of J and it to one at J equals infinity and it goes to zero at, um, at J equals zero. And the point is that at large Q, you can interpolate uh, between weak, weak and strong coupling. So let's draw this picture. So it has these quasi-normal modes. Um, so it's meromorphic. Good. It has no zeros uh, for any coupling. Good. It has no Christmas tree. Um, so, well, I don't want to say it's bad, but it, it just, it doesn't, there's no black hole similarity or, or whatever you want to ascribe to that statement. It, it, okay. Yeah, exactly. So it, it, it's dual to an ADS2 black hole. Um, so that's in the, in the strong coupling limit. So uh, there's one dimensionalist uh, parameter. A temperature, uh, which is beta j, 
and in, in the low temperature limit, um, or at strong coupling, this approaches an ADS2 block. So this is. So a slightly more interesting example is the SYK chain. So in this example, you take a chain of these SYK dots of these uh, um, SYK models that are localized at a single site, and you and you and you couple them uh, via some interaction. So this uh, this was computed by uh, Choi Mize uh, Sarozzi, and they computed the uh, the energy density correlator, and they found a more interesting answer. So it's given by some complicated hypergeometric function, and for certain values of the coupling, uh, the poles go off the imaginary axis. But they still asymptotically stay on the imaginary axis. So again, you find it's meromorphic. And actually, you find numerically it has no zeros. Which is um, a surprising thing if you look at the function. And there's no Christmas tree. Okay, so the question is, is this Q equals infinity limit special? Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's yeah, so it's, it's the same story where there's a lot of poles. So you can't really it's not known it's i mean it's a it's a lattice model so we don't expect it to continue on holographic models. which the no zero has been very surprising and also the so um ah uh, sorry so there are uh, there are poles which are the ones that i drew um Yeah, sorry. So what I'm calling the Christmas tree is this is uh, when it opens up um, into the complex plane. So these uh, uh, these imaginary uh, quasi normal modes that uh, that appear for uh, uh, BCC, I, I don't call it the Christmas tree. Um, so yeah, a Christmas tree is this. So it's it's the, the situation where you have this new region of the complex plane, and it, and all I'm saying is that that's not present for SRT. Maybe that's not obvious. Angle is pi over d. Okay, so this is promising. Um, it looks like these holographic properties, which have no right or reason to extend to finite coupling, sometimes do. So we want to go further, and we want to ask, is this Q to infinity limit uh, 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 special? And I want, to, I want to use the following strategy, which may sound counterintuitive. So I want to compute this thing um, as a power series in time, at small times. Um, so this is counterintuitive because you certainly cannot see this exponential decay at, at small times. But uh, never, uh, nevertheless, let's proceed. And uh, let me take infinite temperature uh, uh, just to make the expression, well, actually, sorry, let me take infinite temp uh, temperature because that's where I can do the, uh, the computation uh, for SYK. And at, at infinite temperature, we have to compute uh, this object. 
and we expand in time. And uh, this has an expansion oops, as, a, as a sum We have a trace of a double commutator of H with O. And then plus order uh, T to the fourth. And at, at each order, you have uh, a, a larger number of uh, nested commutators. And this is called the moment expansion of the, of the correlator. So this has a finite radius of convergence. And there's a conjecture about this, which I will now explain. So this is called the universal operator growth hypothesis uh, from Parker et al. in 2018. Statement about non-continuum theories. So uh, spin chains and spin systems like the SYK model. And the statement is, in a chaotic system, you have the following behavior of G of O um, at large omega. It should uh, decay exponentially. Uh, 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 this is not true in, in integrable systems. Uh, it is true, as we, as we discussed, in, in continuum field theories. Because in that case, alpha is, is beta times omega over two. Uh, but the, uh, the conjecture is that even away from the continuum, this is always true in, in chaotic theory. And this implies a, a singularity. In G of T. At T equals plus or minus I alpha. So the radius of convergence of the uh, 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 sum is alpha. This alpha, a priori, and, and also in practice, has nothing to do with the quasi-normal modes. Um, so what you find, if you were able to compute a lot of these moments, you will find a function, which is t and g of t. It starts at 1, and then it, it decays a little bit. Not a lot, but it could be more extreme, it could be like this. And then this is alpha. And so using this moment expansion, you'll be able to get this function up to t equals alpha, but it's certainly not exponentially the same yet. And what we need to do is we need to fit function to some of uh, some of our exponentials. So that looks hard. Um, but actually, it's possible. You just need to know the, a lot of moments. So you need to know the other uh, the function really, really well. So if you, if you, if you uh, can do this, if you can uh, compute a lot of moments, you can uh, 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 do this exponential fit, as I'll explain in a moment. Yeah. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Any other questions about this approach? So what is possible to compute, uh, compute these moments? And uh, this has been checked in uh, chaotic spin chains and in, uh, in, in, in SYK um, and, and probably in examples, but uh, the, uh, those were the, uh, the original examples. Um, in, in integral uh, uh, theories, many other uh, possibilities are available, like e to the minus omega squared is available. But in chaotic theories, the conjecture, uh, this is always true. This is the, I think this is the slowest it can be. Yeah. 
So it, it's from Carlson down. Yeah, so what is known? It, it, I think it is believed to be lower. No, no, it, it, it's not believed to, you mean, oh, you mean alpha? Oh no, alpha is, alpha is just positive. Yeah, yeah. As, as, as far as I know. And yeah, so note that even that beta equals zero, like, even at its infinite temperature, uh, we can still have um, exponential decay, even though in in a in a CFT you, you wouldn't get that. So in spin chains, you can compute these new ends, and um, there's a uh, there's an algorithm to compute them in exponential time. And the record is 45. So that's, oh, the 45 moments. <laughs> so, so n equals one to 45. So, uh, so you just run this algorithm on the computer, eventually uh, this exponential time catches up with you and then you're stuck there. Well, it's, it just gets slow. <laughs> Exponential kind of long. Um, in SYK, in the same paper, uh, the Parker et al. paper, uh, there's a polynomial al algorithm. And this uh, generates the moments as rational numbers. So not as, uh, not uh, uh, numerically, and you can do it in, in polynomial time. A polynomial time, by the way, also be long. Um, so in two weeks, on my computer, uh, you can get 1,500. So n equals one to, I think, maybe. And, and these are all numbers. Uh, but so this is 500 uh, digits of uh, precision. Uh, uh, of this function up there, up there. And I want to emphasize that if, if you just know the function over a very, very good precision, if you want to fit it to exponential, because exponentials start uh, decaying out here. Okay. So we're getting there. Yeah, I should say how they derived this algorithm. So um, the way they did it is to write down the Schrodinger-Dyson equation. Uh, so this is directly at large n. Um, you have these uh, uh, Schrodinger-Dyson equations, which are, are satisfied uh, by the correlator. And then you can solve them as a power series in time. And uh, it's, it's pretty uh, straightforward. Right, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so uh, for a spin chain, you, you cannot do this. Okay, so that gives us the function. And now we have to fit it. So what you shouldn't do is, is put it on Mathematica and run find fit, how to, how to do this. Um, So if you use find fit, it's not going to converge. So the strategy we take, um, so now we're getting there. So we're going to uh, uh, truncate the sum of our exponentials. So we're going to write g of t lambda n e to the minus i omega n times t. We have now m exponential. And we're going to solve this on, on a grid. And the grid is equally spaced. 
the T. And um, it goes from X to zero uh, to 2M minus one. It might just seem like I'm giving you some numerical procedure, but we're, we're going somewhere interesting. So here we have um, uh, 2M equations and 2M um, uh, things to compute. So at least it, it's the right number of uh, variables. But it looks very nonlinear because these are in the exponential. And the question is how to solve it. So th this is often done. I haven't found anyone do this in physics yet, but the idea is you have um, a large number of resonances and, and you know the signal and you want, and, and you want to find the, uh, the resonances. And uh, this is the procedure to, uh, to do this. I should also mention, um, there's a nice paper by uh, uh, Tomas Prozen from 20 years ago, or I think it's two, um, where he, he uses a similar uh, uh, method for spin change and he gets the first couple resonances. But I, I don't know anything that went beyond that. So the way to do it is we look for a non-unitary operator whose eigenvalues are these, um, okay, sorry. We look for a non-Hermitian operator whose eigenvalues are these omega n. Now, omega n's are not real, so it, they can't be eigenvalues of, of a Hamiltonian, but they can be eigenvalues of a non-Hermitian. Hermitian Hamilton. So let's define u equals minus i h times delta t. Uh, so this is a uh, time evolution operator. And now let's define a discrete Krilov subspace uh, to be our initial initial state psi, uh, which is one fermion, and then u psi dot, 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 you, how many do I want? Oh yeah, two and minus, <laughs> two and minus one, I'm sorry. So this is just our initial state. It's, it's uh, the state, a uh, time evolved by uh, uh, delta T all the way up to uh, two and minus one. And this is setting up the grid. So this is a, a finite sub, uh, subspace of the four Hilbert space. And now we find u tilde um, m uh, uh, to be the projection of u onto the. So I, I took my unitary operator, I projected onto a finite subspace. And this is an, a non unitary operator. And it, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it, H here is Hermitian, but I'm defining my uh, time evolution operator uh, to be non-unitary uh, non by projecting it onto this finite subspace. So you can, you see that this uh, solves the problem, namely at a time which is n delta t, um, we have on the one hand that this is equal to u to the n, I'm sorry, oops, u tilde m to the n, I'm sorry. And on, on the other hand, this has an eigenvalue on position into n equals one to, to, to m of lambda n e to the minus i omega one and n delta. Oh, what I've told you is that in order to compute, in order to solve this problem on a grid, you want to project onto this curl up uh, subspace and, and compute the, uh, the eigenvalues of the time evolution operator on this uh, subspace. So this, is, this can be done 
knowing only the values of the function in the range that uh, uh, that I I wrote down, uh, provided the, uh, 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 that the grid is uh, taken uh, have a max time that's less than alpha. And then you can compute the quasinomials omega n. So note that as m goes to infinity, so this is really that we uh, want we want m infinity and delta t goes to zero. So this is a, a very finely spaced grid. And in, in this limit, we've solved this full equation. So there's an infinite number of quasinomial modes. Uh, but in this limit, u tilde does not equal u. Because the eigenvalues of u are, are purely on the, on, the, on the unit circle, and, and the eigenvalues of u tilde are inside the unit circle. Uh, so this looks a bit strange. But actually, it, it happens in holography also. So explain why. So there's something called the double cone geometry, uh, which is due to Saj uh, Shinker Stanford, and more recently, uh, Ba Chen Maldasena. And for our purposes, what she does is it gives you an operator whose eigenvalues are the quasi-normal ones. So this is the bulk analog of my u tilde. So let me, I'm sure you guys all know, but uh, uh, let me just write it down briefly. So the story here is you have your black hole. And you have your boost operator k. And what you compute is trace e to the minus i k t. And what this does is it identifies the two-sided black hole under t go under time goes to t plus t. Uh, so this is an, an identification of the two-sided black hole. Uh, but actually, this thing is not well defined because near the near this point, the fields um, have some singular behavior. And what you really need to do is regulate this operator uh, with an i epsilon position. And so what they actually compute is trace e to the minus i k tilde t. And you can look at their paper for the, uh, the uh, definition of tilde. Uh, but this is a non-Hermitian operator whose eigenvalue of the quasi normal one. Now, I'm not saying that uh, there's some precise analog between these two con uh, constructions, but it's, it's the same uh, kind of story. In order to compute the, uh, the quasi normal modes, you write them as some eigenvalues of some non-Hermitian operator. So, I kind of skimmed over this limit. M goes to infinity, uh, delta t goes to zero. I'm assuming that this limit exists, uh, but in fact, it need not exist. So what could happen is that the poles in that limit condense into cusps. And uh, we have no proof that that uh, doesn't happen. So the statement of Merrimore, um, Um, uh, the spectrum of the limiting operator as m goes to infinity uh, is discrete. So in other words, holes that condense into cups. I would like to think of this as some kind of eigenvalue repulsion. So you as eigenvalues, and in, in a chaotic theory, we might expect them not to get too close together. So meromorphy, you, you might want to think of as some kind of eigenvalue uh, uh, repulsion. Any questions?
Yeah, yeah. Because you have, yeah. If you if you worked at finite n in SYK, you would you would run into this. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's not a puzzle. It's a it's a statement that at, at large Q there's no Christmas tree in that sort of thing. Um so what I'm doing now is I'm I'm describing the how, how to do the computation when you have no analytic control over the over the two point function, but you can compute these moments. And I explained if you have the moments, how to how to compute the uh, the Green's function, and then how to numerically compute the quasi normal modes by diagonalizing uh, this operator uh, utility. So next, I'll explain what happens when you do that procedure. <laughs> Any other questions? Shall I write down the answer? So I guess this is a spoiler. But... It would be great if the minimum distance between poles was bounded by the uh, opposite exponent, something like that. Well, there are no examples. I'll, I'll give one example. Okay, so here's the answer. So there's all this, all this business, but let's just find the answer. Uh, and I want to draw it to scale so that you know what it looks like. So draw it real big. Okay, so this is Q equals four. There's no holography. This is infinite temperature. You should not have any expect expectations for what it's like. Um, but it looks like this. So all the modes that have converged so far in the procedure that I described. This is a slow procedure, but I used 1500 modes, and uh, that's how far I've been able to push it so far. So we have our, oops, yeah, our poles. And then there's more. And the, you go inside, the denser. The, these have all converged to two, uh, two uh, digits of uh, uh, precision. So this is a fairly conservative plot. I didn't want to make any crazy statements. Um, it's the poles that have converged. So. We have zeros. So much for that. Um, so I'd, I'd, yes. Uh, so, sorry. Oh, sorry. This is poles in the frequency plane. So the 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 at, at finite and the the function has a full has a full pole in the, in the, in the frequency. And then you take m goes to infinity, and you and you look for conversion. So down here there are all these spurious modes that have not converged yet. So I don't want to say anything about that. This was did by Stanford, Stryker, and Roberts, and it works to the degrees. So this method at least satisfies a certain uh, consistency uh, check. Uh, so they use a, a different approach to the Schrodinger-Dyson equations, which gives less precision, uh, but allows you to compute the first pleasant. Uh, 
So it's it's purely numerically in, in their case and not uh, semi analytically. Okay, so I, I wanted to, I was thinking about how to present this table. Oh, good. Um, and there are things that I, I definitely want to say. And then there are things which I probably shouldn't say, but I should give some interpretation. So obvious is two columns, uh, it's speakable. And I, I'm happy to take the questions about this column. <laughs> Um, Meromorphies is good. Uh, there's on the other side. Uh, and the angle is 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 pi over three plus uh point oh oh one. And and the residue. So remember, in the case of the holographic results, uh, you could actually take the put on here, and, and you can see the exponential decay. Here, you obviously cannot take this limit, but you can look at the residue, and, and, you, and, and you find this exponential decay. And uh, the poles and zeros, so the first zeros, so, um, that violates the holographic answer. Uh, dense at minus i infinity. Okay. Uh, so extrapolation. Uh, so there's more. There's more poles than here. So uh, just from looking at what's converged so far, it seems like the density is increasing. It's a great question. I, I don't think I don't have enough data so far. So. But yeah, it's actually a paper by uh, Starnet and uh, Gozdanov that called adding branches to the quasi-known modes of the, of the Christmas tree, and it looks a bit like this. Yeah, so, oh, oh good. So I, I have less new. So one statement is, is you have to run this algorithm for each two separately, kind of a nightmare because you need you need analytic precision, and as soon as you leave Q arbitrary, it 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 takes a lot longer. So as you increase Q, I have less data, but what happens is that these modes collide and they go onto the imaginary axis. These modes collide, and and the whole tree gets pushed down, and it also closes up. So a large Q ends up looking like this. Like that. But, uh, but for any any finite fixed Q, there's still a true. At least that's what the numeric can just suggest. Uh-huh. Yes. Right, yeah. Yeah, it's not maximum quality. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. I can try. It, it might work. I can try. <laughs> I guess then you still get nonlinear equations. Yeah, I guess you we get things like omega squared, which is hard to solve. This form is easy, easiest, easiest, easy to solve because you can make this operate with eigenvalues for the. You know, but it, it might. I'm not saying it doesn't work.
but yeah, so you still have omega over omega over j or, or beta over omega. Which are let's uh, let's take beta equals zero. So then the only dimensionless parameter is omega over j. Okay, so uh, what should we say on this side? So look, we have some kind of stringy black hole. I won't say what I mean by string because we're in, in SYK and who knows. And it has some quasi-normal mode. So that's, uh, that would be the interpre interpretation of uh, Marimorphic. The interpretation of this Christmas tree, that there's some kind of uh, black hole singularity in this in this uh, stringy black hole. And because theta equals pi over three, it looks like ADS4. Even here, I'll, I'll make a, a question mark. I have no idea. Um, yeah. yeah. And here we would we would say, Here's some very stringy geometry. Near the singularity. Because as I, I tried to emphasize, if you want to probe the black hole singularity, you want to go to minus infinity. Time to complain about this. Any, any questions or complaints? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know what this means, but uh, it it seems to be a, 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 a suggestive uh, picture to me. Yeah, so the uh, the other thing you can do is you can you, you can make this meromorphy a little bit more stark, which is you can uh, take uh, q equals two s y k, and then you can couple it to q equals four uh, by some small coupling. So uh, q equals two has a cut on the real axis. Um, so this is lambda equals zero. Uh, lambda equals point one. This cut turns into pole. So it's, as soon as you break, we see the cut dissolving. So that's uh, suggestive that this conject uh, chaos implies meromorphy, uh, that there's something to that. So let me conclude. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. So not only can we not do that, but we to any direction. So resolve. I don't know. <laughs> well, it, it, but it's a different. It, like, yeah. So it's a it's a stringy. It's a stringy singularity, whatever that means. But it's clear that there's this. You can at least go a little bit down, but then at some point it, it gets very dense, and whatever angle you go at, it, you're not going to be able to code that. So that would be the, the mathematical thing. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what to say in the ball. All right, so uh, let me conclude with some questions. Uh, in my opinion, um, the stage that this is at is we just need a ton of examples. So, so we model at large n, um, and it might be possible to do this moment method, uh, the matrix, uh, matrix model. You could do spin chains. Which was started by uh, uh, the paper of uh, Prozen in in O2, but maybe there's a a, uh, a Christmas tree if you keep going further. And um, 
of course, um, personally, what I'm interested in is, is n equals four um, at, at some small but finite coupling. So at weak coupling, or forget about n equals four. So large n gauge theory. <laughs> so uh, it is not known. At weak coupling, it is not known what the analytic structure is. So that seems like a nice target um, that could have experimental implications. Um, uh, a thermal gauge theory. So, question: uh, Does chaos imp imply a meromorphy? So this seems to be uh, possible to me by these examples. It would be nice to prove it, uh, maybe using this eigenvalue uh, repulsion intuition. Is there a bulk? So is there a stringy black hole? And what does that mean? Uh, and in particular, is the, is the black hole singularity resolved in string theory? And finally, we have this no zeros thing that applies in, in certain models, in the holography and large Q. Uh, and the question is, what does that mean? Okay, so thank you for listening. Uh, so the one, uh, uh, the one matrix model is integrable. So let's take a two matrix model and uh, compute its one. So you might, it might be possible using uh, uh, this matrix bootstrap, um, but I, I, I haven't looked at it. But that, any chaotic ma uh, matrix model, the conjecture would be it has polynomial modes. Oh, for instance, in BFFS, um, this is a paper of uh, Briggs and Maldisena, and they found a Christmas tree at strong coupling. And so you could also ask this question away from strongly coupled BFFS. Is it filled in like uh, like the SLK one? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a matrix quantum thing. Yeah. What scale? I, for some reason, I expect cuts because n is not the largest scale in the problem. But I, I, I could be wrong. I'm about ten years behind. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. In SYK, that in in spin systems there could be. Um, I think in CFT you're right. But the opposite is quantum too. Okay. Yeah, I, I I think in that in that computation you might be able to, um, because. You turn on lambda equals point one, and you see how the minimum distance scales with lambda. Uh, but I, I I haven't done it, but yeah, yes, yes. Right. So I, I can tell you what they did, which is they um they looked at the um at the OPE expansion um, in, in the, in the light, uh, light light channel. And you have 
uh, double trace operators and you have uh, multi stress tensors. And they threw away the multi or they threw away the double trace operators and they look at uh, and they looked at the full stress tensor block. And they and they showed that you could uh, derive uh, the Christmas tree uh, structure from that block. Now, extending the finite lambda, I don't think it's possible to do. Because you would need like expectation values of stress tensors or finite lambda. Non zero Lee Oppenheimer. Yes. Yeah. I agree, uh, but this is a different kind of level uh, of repulsion, which is levels of U tilde. Um, but I don't think the spacings are of order even minus F. They're of order one. If you even minus F, zero. Maybe that too, yeah. <laughs> Maybe that too. It, I can buy you attraction. And <laughs> yeah, I'm Yeah, I guess to me right now, there's a pattern and I'm trying to, I mean, there's several examples and I'm trying to find some kind of pattern. That seems to be, yeah. And maybe there's just no universal thing to say. But. Yes. Uh, by this, you mean the double form? Or... Uh huh. Yeah. I think that horizon structure is more related. So that horizon structure uh, gives the a specific specific form of the potential that I wrote down, which is the sum of our exponentials with a quantized uh, decay rate. So that's related to a periodicity in, in imaginary time. And that in turn is, can be used to derive this zeros property. I think it is not related to the black hole singularity. So in, in BTZ, you, you have this same boost symmetry, but you have no uh, curvature singularity. I think it, they're, they're, uh, they're slightly different concepts. Yeah, that's true. 